All right, we'd like to welcome everyone to the Fairfield Arts and Convention Center, Sondheim Theater. My name is Rustin Lippincott, and I have the privilege of being tonight's moderator. We'd like to thank Fairfield Media Center, uh, which is recording this for future playback, and we'd like to thank KMCD Classic 96, which is actually doing a live stream broadcast of tonight's forum. We'd also like to thank our partners, uh, the Fairfield Area Chamber of Commerce and the Fairfield Economic Development Association. They were the uh, kind of the driving forces of tonight's event. So I'd like to welcome our candidates. I'd first like to read uh, what we're calling the rules for tonight's forum. So this is not a debate, but an opportunity for candidates to express their views. Candidates, will you please refrain from directing questions or responses to another candidate? Candidates, please do not ask the audience for input during response times. Yeah, but I can ask for all the input. Like, are we excited? Yes. Uh, audience members will refrain from making comments during the forum. Audience members that have submitted the questions, we have questions, but if you'd like to submit some questions, please see Darian or Josh. The questions perceived as one-sided or attacking will not be read and will be removed. So candidates, candidates will be seated at individual high top tables, as you can see, and uh, you may alternate between standing or sitting, uh, whatever makes it comfortable for you. Uh, the moderator, Rustin, will be in the center of the table. Did anyone have any questions on where I would be? I'm in the center of the ta room, no. All right, so the, each candidate will have three minutes for an opening statement. There will be one minute and then 30 second sign held up by our uh, Nikki here is our timer. There will be a stop raise to indicate your time has expired. We ask that you please stop when the, when the red is raised. Uh, the candidate will have 90 seconds to answer each question. There will be a 30 second warning. And again, there will be a stop sign raised when you have exceeded, when you have met the 90 seconds. So each candidate will have a two minutes to prepare for a closing remarks. And each candidate will have three minutes for a closing remark. Once again, we'd like to thank you for attending and making yourself available, and thanks for your service to our district. We'll uh, lead it with the um, opening statement with Mary Stewart. Good evening, everybody, and I wanna thank all of you for coming. I wanna thank the Sondheim and the Chamber for hosting this event this evening. I am Mary Stewart, and I'm running for the Iowa Senate. I'm a native Iowan, uh, born and raised in Centerville, where I attended high school in my first two years of community college, the first generation of my family to enroll in college. I come from a blue collar family, raised by a single mom and my maternal grandparents who were Croatian immigrants and coal miners to that area. My father's parents were um, Missouri farmers, and our family story was one of economic hardship, but also one of an incredibly strong work ethic, strength of character, and great pride. Through a series of circumstances, I've lived on my own from the age of 14, supporting myself and completing my education. I understand firsthand the hardships that many families and many Iowans face. I married my high school sweetheart, Tom, and we've been married 40 years and have three grown sons. I've lived in Ottumwa since 1975. We've lived in the same house for 40 years now. For 33 years, I worked at Indian Hills Community College, the last 10 as Dean of Academic Services. My work responsibilities were diverse in nature and broad in scope, supervising approximately 65 employees across a 10 county region, and I served on numerous state and regional committees. I am a first time pol candidate for political office, making the decision to run while witnessing the actions of the last two sessions of the Iowa legislature as they systematically privatized Medicaid, which led to cuts to critical care and services and delayed or denied payments to providers and hospitals all while out-of-state insurance companies um, made hundreds of millions of dollars from Iowa. I was also upset with the destruction of workers' rights by gutting collective bargaining for public employees and limiting workers' compensation. Um, 
The threat to IPERS for public employees is something that interests me greatly as an IPERS retiree, one of 360,000 across this state. I want to make sure that that's something that stays in place. And other actions that have been taken. I'm not using this as a springboard to run for any higher office. I'm a citizen just like you who saw a job that needed to be done and stepped up to do it when no one else would. My life has been a life of public service, of which I'm very proud, offering a chance and a hand up to others through public education and job training, just as I received and my mother before me many years ago. I have the experience, the skills, the work ethic, and the vision to help train Iowa students, and I welcome that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Marinette. I'm Marinette Miller Meeks, and I'm running for the State Senate uh, District 41. Uh, my background is quite varied and diverse, and I'm going to start uh, a long time ago. I was uh, the fourth of eight children born to my father, who was a master sergeant in the Air Force, and my mother had various jobs. She uh, did not graduate high school, got a GED, but uh, neither of my parents were formally educated, although I would say that they were self-educated. Uh, very early on, I wanted to become a teacher uh, because of my second grade teacher, Miss Tenniswood, in Michigan. We traveled around a lot, of course, being in the military, uh, but uh, ultimately, when I was 15, I had uh, burns that I suffered on my arms and my legs and a long hospitalization and decided I was going to become a doctor. I left the hospital and went home and told my parents that that's what I was going to do, and they were a little bit surprised because they weren't quite sure how the fourth of eight kids in a military family, uh, rather humble circumstances, was going to be able to go to medical school. At this time, my father got transferred back to Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas, and I decided I was going to leave high school. So I left high school at 16, became self-supporting, worked, uh, started at San Antonio Junior College, or now Community College, and uh, was able to go to Community College, work full-time, enlist in the Army at age 18, Ultimately, after 24 years, I became a lieutenant colonel in the Army as well, was able to get a degree in nursing, go into the military active duty uh, from enlisted to the officer corps, met my husband, who is here with me tonight, and uh, was able to eventually go to medical school working and going to school full time. We chose to come to Iowa uh, to do our residency, or my residency in, at the University of Iowa, and then I went on faculty at University of Michigan, back to University of Iowa, and then into private practice in Ottumwa. So we've chosen to live in Southeast Iowa, continue to live here, work here, recreate here, shop and dine here. I was director of uh, Iowa Department of Public Health and traveled back and forth from Des Moines to Ottumwa, and currently work in Burlington and still travel back and forth. I became interested in this race, uh, one, because I was asked to take a look at the race, given the issues on health care, which are more than uh, Medicaid, um, looking for more choice, uh, lower cost, and better quality care in health care. Also, uh, job creation, economic development, having uh, run a small business, had to fill out paychecks, make ends meet within a small business. I know what excessive regulation can do to businesses and what tax policy does to businesses. And also uh, looking to help protect the tax cuts, which have put more money into all of our pockets and have also helped to uh, increase wages and uh, create more jobs in our uh, area. I have the energy, the knowledge, the expertise. I'm available, accessible, and I'm trusted. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, now we'll go to Phil Miller. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Chamber, and thank you, uh, FIDA, for hosting this, and thanks for everyone coming out tonight. And remember, uh, you can vote tomorrow. You can vote next week at the courthouse absentee. Uh, you don't have to take in an ID or anything. You just go in, and your, your name gets checked off a list, and you can vote. And then you can vote on November 6th at your regular polling place, but that day you will need a, a picture ID to vote on November 6th. Um, I'm a fifth generation Iowan. Uh, my great great grandfather, Nathan Miller, uh, was a medical doctor and he moved to South English back in 1854. Uh, since then, uh, my, my ancestors have been here. So uh, uh, my parents uh, had a farm in Keokuk County. I was born in Sigourney, Iowa, uh, graduated from English Valley. Uh, then went on to uh, Iowa State University and got a degree in veterinary medicine. 
Uh, my wife, Connie, and I moved to Fairfield in 1975, and we've been here ever since. Uh, we raised four children. They all graduated from Fairfield High School, and they went on to graduate from a state public university all within four years. They all live in the Des Moines area. They are married, and we have 12 grandkids. Um, I'm a veterinarian. I co-own a, a veterinary practice here in Fairfield. Uh, over the years, uh, I've, I've taken care of uh, large animals and small animals. Uh, I feel that I am a part of the community. I enjoy the Jefferson County, Fairfield area. Uh, uh, that's why we live here. Um, we, uh, over the years, I became active and got elected to the school board. Uh, because of that, I got to know Kurt Hansen quite well. And when Kurt passed away uh, in June of 17 from cancer, I, I decided to step forward and, and I succeeded in getting elected at a special election August of last year. Uh, I'm currently your state representative. Uh, I would like to continue to be your state representative. I'm currently on the uh, House Education Committee, the House uh, Ag Committee, the House Transportation Kit Committee, and Budget Appropriations for Education, which is the Regent Universities, the Community Colleges, and uh, the School for the Deaf and the Blind. So uh, I am glad you're here tonight, and I, I look forward to a, a good evening of conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Shipley. Many thanks to everyone for being here and feeding the chamber for getting us all together. My name is Jeff Shipley. I live here in Fairfield, blessed to call Fairfield home. I make a living as a solar power consultant on the front lines of the renewable energy industry. I'm very proud to be electrifying Iowa with megawatts of solar power. Also work for a local organic food company. Proud to call myself a sauerkraut salesman. And Lastly, uh, something that really makes me stand out is over the last couple of years, I've been blessed to develop my skills in the arts and culture community as a stand-up comedian. And the idea there is our politics needs a lot of healing, and laughter is the best medicine. That being said, I'm taking a very serious look at the issues facing our communities and our towns, and basically I see a lot of important conversations that we're not having. Our local communities are trading away our power to state bureaucrats, and all we're getting in return are unfunded, unfunded mandates and authoritarian dictates. And it's these bureaucrats, these unfunded mandates, that's really harming our education system, that's totally disrupted our mental health care. But at Des Moines, the, the debate seemed to be about how much taxpayer money we're going to spend. And that's really shallow, because I see a lot of money, a lot of problems that, that yeah, sure, money helps, but it's not going to solve it. For instance, we have a staggering number of kids in our public schools that are on free and reduced lunch. Now, no one's going to oppose spending money to feed these kids, but that's not going to solve the problem. We need to ask the tough questions. Why aren't these kids getting the love they need at home? Why do we have so many single mothers in our community? Why do we have young men running away from responsibility? Why are we leaving so much human potential on the table? There's also a culture of conformity that I really don't like. This idea of, of this overwhelming political correctness that keeps us from being open and honest, that kind of prevents people from voicing their true opinions. It closes us off, and we need to open up. Favorite thing that I say on the campaign trail is peace and prosperity, peace and prosperity. I repeat it as often as possible. I even put a peace sign and hearts on some of my logos and signs. A lot of people thought that was a stupid idea. I did it anyway. I wanted this campaign to be more about me, more than just about me, more than just a candidate's name on a sign. I wanted it to tap into something bigger. Peace, the idea of peace that comes from faith in ourselves, faith in our community, faith in God. And to me, the heart sign means prosperity, the prosperity that comes from loving ourselves, loving life, you know, unleashing human creativity. That's how we create prosperity. So I'm here to take a real serious look at the issues. I feel like I'm offering a lot of perspectives that get neglected in the political debate. And I'm very thankful to be on stage, dive into the issues, and share my concerns and thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. All right, we've got the opening statements underway. underway. Uh, well done. So our first question will go to Marionette. Iowa offers tax credit programs for new and expanding businesses, which have been helpful. With the issue of attracting and retaining a workforce, 
Should Iowa be adding incentives for potential employees considering locating in or staying in rural Iowa? Well, we certainly know that the uh, tax credits or tax policy on the federal level has helped even here in Fairfield. If uh, Jeff had mentioned that he works for a solar power company and the ability to have uh, that, um, if you want to call it a subsidy or uh, beneficial tax treatment has allowed that um, part of the industry to grow. The same is true of the wind farms that um, occupy our state. Uh, there is favorable tax treatment for them in order to try to get to a place where those sources of energy are competitive with more um, rudimentary um, uh, ground sources of energy. So tax policy is very important for businesses. Regulation is very important to how you conduct your business, where the energy goes in a business, being able to hire people, how much you pay them, uh, and being able to put money into research and development to grow the business, hire more people, and pay higher wages. So I think it's a very important aspect of attracting business to uh, the Southeast Iowa area, to our state in general, and even throughout our nation. So I would be supportive of them, but I do think you have to look at return on investment. Now we'll go to Mary. Iowa offers tax credit programs for new and expanding businesses, which have been helpful. With the issue of attracting and retaining a workforce, should Iowa be adding incentives for potential employees considering locating in or staying in rural Iowa? Well, I think the state of Iowa has been in the business of providing tax incentives for a, a number of years now, and I think there are reasons to do that, to recruit new business and business activity to the state. However, I do think that there are limits to what the state can afford in the way of incentives. And I think what we're seeing now um, is a situation where we're faced with cuts to services, and much of it is attributed or can be attributed to the fact that um, tax credits to large corporations have reached um, really large proportions in the state of Iowa. One of Iowa's largest corporations with over $5.26 billion in sales paid no Iowa income tax in 2017 and received a $14 million check as a research tax credit. Well, nobody objects to that if it really results in, the, in um, an increase in the number of jobs available in the state, but I think that those need to be carefully weighed and evaluated one by one to make sure that the promised jobs are actually there and um, made available once the credits have been awarded. Iowa offers tax credit programs for new and expanding businesses, which have been helpful. With the issue of attracting and retaining a workforce, should Iowa be adding incentives for potential employees considering locating in or staying in rural Iowa? Uh, we'll go with uh, Jeff. So the question is on tax credits, and absolutely I believe we need to be incentivizing business, and I certainly belong to an industry that has benefited by generous tax incentives. Um, as a rule, yeah, I think the people and the businesses can spend their money a lot better than government can. Uh, when looking at how to grow our communities and attracting new families, obviously working with industry and bringing new jobs is very important. I'd also be interested in property tax reform uh, to drive down those fixed costs on families. That's something I have been hearing a lot about, uh, how we can tax property more fairly and, and give more money to families. Uh, I guess my biggest concern is making sure that it's done fairly. I think there is kind of a fine line between corporate welfare and actual tax incentives that drive growth. And so that would be my biggest concern, is making sure that we're not favoring one industry or another, or favoring um, a new business versus an existing business. And this is something we had in town, I think it was four years ago, when there was very generous tax incentives being rolled out to support a new business that was gonna employ, I think, eight or 10 people. And there was a business right next door that employed 50 people, and they didn't have any tax incentives at all. So uh, as long as we apply it fairly and evenly, I think it could be a great tool to use. And in general, uh, yeah, we need to be doing everything we can to incentivize growth, bring new young families to our community. Phil. Uh, these credits had their origins, I think, uh, during and after the Great Recession back in uh, 2008, 2009, and, and, and they did help. Uh, they helped some of the largest uh, corporations in Iowa and indeed largest corporations in the world uh, start growing again and, and hiring again. The, the situation is that we're 10 years out from that, and, and these uh, uh, research and development credits, they, they have no sunset, they have no cap, and they're refundable. And that means, uh, as was mentioned before, even if a company has no state income tax liability, 
they, they get that money sent back to them in a check, and that's, that's our money, and we're, we're giving that back to some big, wealthy corporations. I think that's upside down. I think that money should be going to education and our roads and law enforcement and things like that. And then at the end of the day, if there's money left over in the state budget and we want to help incentivize uh, private businesses, uh, uh, that would be okay. Uh, I currently employ over 20 people, and I know what it's like to make a, uh, a payroll every two weeks and to pay all the bills at the end of the month. And I, I don't look for assistance from the government to, to, to meet my obligations and grow, but I, I do understand the theory behind it. I think some of it is good, but that needs to be looked at and, and uh, pared back. Thank you. All right, so we made it through our first question. Everyone can just relax a little bit, take a deep sigh, deep relief, and we're gonna have some fun. All right, so the second question, we will start with Marionette. At a, at a state level, how will you address the political, cultural, and socioeconomic tensions that are so strong and pervasive in our country at this time? Uh, well, sometimes you think you can cut the tension with a knife. Um, and all I can say is that working as a physician and as a nurse, uh, you come uh, into contact with a variety of people from a variety of circumstances, very diverse backgrounds, high income, low income, every political party. Um, and uh, I think if you continue to treat people with respect and with dignity, accord them their worth and their value, uh, then I think that that's reciprocated. Um, I do believe uh, Michelle Obama when she said, if they go low, we go high. My mama always said, you don't have to get down into the gutter. And so I believe that. When I came back on faculty at the University of Iowa, I was pleased to know that uh, when I was called uh, by the telephone operator, they said, Dr. Miller Meeks, we're so happy to hear, have you back here. And it was the same with the housekeeping people. And it was important to me, and I remember it, because it reinforced to me that they felt valued in what they did and that I had treated them with dignity and respect. When I was director of public health, you work with all of, of the factions, of, of both political, with lobbyists, with people who have concerns that have needs, and being able to navigate through those, run advisory committees, bring people to consensus, and focus on your job and your outcomes, um, I think I was able to navigate that very well and would continue to do so were I elected. At a, at a state level, how will you address the political, cultural, and socioeconomic tensions that are so strong and so perva pervasive in our country at this time? All right, we'll go with uh, Phil. Over my life, I've, I've had the opportunity to, uh, to uh, work with folks as a professional person, uh, as a large animal veterinarian, as a small animal veterinarian as a spouse, as a father, as a community member, as a member of our church, as a member of the school board. It's all about uh, working together with others to solve things and to have a good life. Uh, when I got elected and went to the uh, State House uh, last January, uh, I learned that all 100 members of the House, it's a very collegial atmosphere and an awful lot of bipartisan work on a lot of common sense bills that uh, make sense. Uh, there are issues where there is a, a, a separation of ways, but uh, there would be a debate and a, a vote, and then uh, we would move on to something else. And that's the way our government works. Uh, we are a democracy. Uh, we're, this is, we're participating right now in, in a great event here of discussion, and then you get to decide who you want to repre represent you, and uh, I, I look at uh, it, it's a great opportunity to work with others, and I don't really notice myself the divide maybe as much as uh, maybe uh, is, is let be, so. Thank you. Go with you, Mary. <laughs> I believe that you conduct yourself at the State House the same way you conduct yourself every day in your personal and professional life. You treat other people with respect. You acknowledge that what they say has value, even if you do not disagree. And my work at the community college, we worked across a broad region and just a wide variety of programs with a wide variety of people. And it was always important every day to know that when you brought those people together at the table, everybody left with the thought that they'd been heard 
and their opinion had been respected, and that they left with um, with a piece of whatever project it was that we were about, that they would, um, they felt invested in it. So I think that when you treat people respectfully and speak respectfully of them, um, when you, you know, take their comments and um, and don't do not retaliate, that that is a way that um, you conduct business. And I think if that happened more often at the state house, I'm pleased to hear that Phil say says it does happen, but that there needs to be a little bit more of that um, in the state house in Des Moines. Thanks, Mary. Jeff. All right, I think this is the most important question that we're facing as a culture, as a nation, as a state, so I'm really happy it got brought up. Um, yeah, it's getting nasty out there, and this is something I had to really you know, think hard about before I entered, because um, that's what really surprises me, and not just how negative and nasty people can be, but how far they go out of their way to be negative and nasty. I, I think the internet culture really hurts it. I think social media really hurts it. In fact, there was one person, uh, for instance, on Facebook said some really, really mean things about me. And then when I meet him in person, they go, oh, I love you. I just disagree with your politics. It's like, why, why don't you just say that and just have a period on it? That would make me feel a lot better about things. Uh, there was another instance where someone said some really negative things about me. And I go, well, wait a minute. Why are you saying this? And then they, they block me. Um, so, it, you know, we're closing ourselves off and we're not willing to have the difficult conversations. I've been taught my whole life that we, you know, it's impolite to talk about religion and politics. And here we find ourselves a time where we desperately need a very serious conversation about religion and politics. No one knows how to do it. Uh, one really cool thing I participated in that motivated me to get involved was a local group called the Better Angels. Uh, it was retired marriage counselors and they basically got Republicans and Democrats in the same room. They reached out to the party people, so oh, that, that'd be impossible. But we got together, there was laughter, and we, we learned how to ask a genuine question. We learned how to listen. We learned how to see things in not so much black and white and understand the nuances of people's positions. And when we do that, we realize we have so much more in common than we give ourselves credit for. So I definitely recommend those workshops and a very important question. Let's all come together for healing. Thank you. All right. so. Uh... We'll go back, or we'll go to Phil Miller for our third question. Iowa stands number one in high school graduation rates in the country. However, employers often state that many students coming out of high school are not work ready. As a legislator, what do you think needs to be done in the current public education model to address this concern? I think it's good that Iowa has been historically leading the country in high school graduation rate. That, that's good. And that's a, a, a positive towards our teachers that work hard, our administrators, our support staff, and, and to we as a community. But uh, a high school diploma uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you're uh, ready to go to college or out into the workforce or even to a community college. Some of our test scores are actually lower than they used to be. They've been creeping downwards. And uh, I think we need, uh, we, we need to realize we've got a different demographic of student uh, uh, coming to school than maybe what uh, we remember when, when we were students. Uh, uh, right now, most of the school districts that I represent have 50 to 60% free and reduced uh, uh, students. That means that a lot of kids come to school and maybe they haven't had breakfast. And uh, our schools need to help provide before school, during school, after school help. Uh, you know, some of the uh, poverty is starting to be generational. Uh, we've got kids coming to school, again, that just need more help. And, and uh, our teachers are doing it. They're doing a good job, but they need more help. And, and I don't want to be someone that just repeats something, but it, they do need some more money. 1% uh, new money this year when our state's growing at about a 4.9% clip. Uh, our our right. schools could use more help. Thank you. Jeff? So the question is, is why, what's wrong with our high school graduates? Why aren't they working? Why aren't they ready to work? And this is a fantastic question. I really want to thank whoever asked it because it strikes at the core of the issue of these larger cultural problems. You know, I was at a high school class last year as a guest lecturer. Half the kids didn't want to be there. They could barely stay awake. And yeah, there was a good portion that were engaged, but 
you know, it wasn't all there. They're not joyfully learning. And a college degree doesn't even mean what it does 10, 15 years ago. There's kids graduating four-year degrees can barely read and write still. I'm not joking. And yeah, even now, I read a blog post today where even Bill Gates was admitting that the Common Core curriculum has failed by every metric, yet he's not going to pay back all the money they spent on it. So there's very serious problems in education. Uh, the solution for me is going to be self-directed learning. Um, basically, our schools are stuck in the 20th century, maybe worse, and we need to really upgrade and reform that to bring it to a 21st century model of learning into the classroom. But it's, it's just sad to see. And it's not, a, it's not a problem that you're just going to throw money at and it's going to go away because we've increased school funding by $700 million in, under the previous administration. So there's something very wrong going on here. Um, and it needs a lot of loving attention. And we really need to work with our children and create an environment where they're joyful to learn, where they wake up eager to go to school, where they stay awake through classes. So, uh, yeah, a great question, and that's something I really want to get to the bottom of in Des Moines. Thank you. Marionette, we'll go to you. I'll read the question again. Iowa stands number one in high school graduation rates in the country. However, employers often state that many students coming out of high school are not work ready. As a, as a legislator, what do you think needs to be done in the current public education model to address this concern? So there's almost two issues. One is uh, depending upon which uh, pattern of work or job or career ready you're going into. One I think most important is that um, there's a huge focus on getting young people ready for college. Not everybody needs to go to college. Um, I have brothers-in-law who have uh, very good jobs and careers, make a good income, uh, electrician, plumbing, diesel mechanic. So there are some students who aren't um, their talent does, and attributes aren't uh, towards the college or a higher education in that way, so we need to be able to mentor and prepare and help students that have a variety of different talents to be able to utilize those talents. Voca vocational programs, skilled trainings, sometimes it's mentoring them with um, uh, a uh, business in their community. So you have various businesses here, Dexter, you have the solar power, you have Creative Edge. I mean, there's many. Uh, you know, even uh, I was going to say Dr. Miller's uh, Dr. Miller's veterinary practice. There may be avenues for pairing students with businesses to see where their focus is and if that's something they'd like to do, and then develop skills training from there. Um, we have 60% of our cost in our higher ed or our education system go to administration. I do think we need to look at the budget and we need to put the money into the classroom with the teachers, with the students, so that we're getting value for that money. Every child needs to be able to graduate and have basic skills of reading, basic math skills, interaction with people, knowing how to get up one time, maybe how to balance a checkbook. Thank you. Mary? Well, I would just say that I think Iowa schools do graduate many good qualified graduates and sometimes it's easy to overlook that when, you, when you're faced with the problems that we deal with in public schools. Um, public schools try to give every kid a good quality general education uh, and they try to teach to the extent that they can any technical skills or job specific skills that students um, have an interest in or, or are uh, interested in pursuing beyond. But it is difficult to think that a student can leave high school with the job skills they need to go out and adequately uh, be prepared for the job market they face. And many employers, when I worked at the community college, mentioned to us that if you give us a good general education student, somebody who has a solid background in reading, writing, and math skills, we can then tailor our program to teach the job specific skills that those people need on the job. So I would just say, I think we have a lot of quality graduates. I also think people need to acknowledge that when you expect your public schools to solve every social ill, you also drastically cut into the time given each day where you can address every academic skill. Thank you. Okay, for question number four, we'll start with Phil. Smart meters have been controversial. What is your position on smart and analog meters? I first learned about smart meters uh, at the end of December, January of last year. 
And uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, Alliant Energy is in the, the process of changing uh, the old analog meter to the new, uh, it's called a smart meter. Uh, it's, it goes from uh, something that's been around for decades to kind of a new technology type thing. It's supposed to be more efficient and uh, so forth. Uh, but I was approached, I know, by some of my constituents that they were concerned about the accuracy, about uh, uh, several different things that, that they, they brought to my attention and that they did not want the new smart meter. And uh, I, I tried to do what I could as a new uh, minority representative. I um, went directly to Alliant Energy and talked to them about the situation and they told me that they would be able to put Fairfield to the bottom of the list to transition and they haven't started yet. That's, that's good. They did talk about some opt-outs. They did not talk about the cost of the opt-out. Uh, let's see, I've uh, talked to the utility board this fall. I just uh, put a letter into the utility board for the docket that comes up on November 6th and 7th. So I, I think there should be able to be an opt-out at no cost if you don't Thank want you. this new technology. Okay, we'll go to Jeff. I'm thankful this question got asked. Uh, it was in this room about four months ago at the IUB hearing where I spoke up and uh, alongside 80 other concerned citizens and basically asked Alliant Energy to work with their customers, not against them. And it was at that point that people began seeing me as a candidate for office and asked me to consider running because uh, they saw leadership and they were desperate for leadership. This is a really important issue because it's complex and it asks some very serious questions about who's in, who has the power, corporations or customers? What are we willing to trade for convenience? What are we going to do with all this new technology? Does it really help us or is something else going on? Highlight of my campaign has been actually I went up to Align Energy to help test uh, radiation equipment and really enjoyed that. Um, fantastic people at Align Energy, great people at Align Energy. They have excellent service, very professional, can't thank Align Energy enough. In fact, I think it's sad the way we take electricity for granted. Uh, never wanting to miss an opportunity to express gratitude. I think every time you flip a light switch, say, thanks, Align Energy. That being said, this smart meter is a disaster waiting to happen. And it's, it's not just the opt-out fee. There's a lot more going on here. And I'm, I'm the Republican. I'm the fiscal conservative in this race. So I'm taking a dollars and cents approach. And Alliance says they're going to save 3 to $4 million a year on smart meter. But who knows, the upgrade could cost $100 million or $200 million. What's the ROI? What's the payback there, 25 years? When I sell a solar array, we want that paid for itself in three years, maybe 10 years. The costs are huge. This is going to be a financial disaster. That's why other states have rejected it. And I'm just very thankful for the activists who've led on this issue. It's very important. I wish I had time to name them right. by names, but I'm very thankful for the activists who've led dating back to 2012. Right. You're in my heart. Let's go to the next. <laughs> Mary, I'll read this question again. Mary. Smart meters have been controversial. What is your position on smart and analog meters? Well, I first became aware of smart, the smart meter issue when I was uh, attending a rotary meeting in Ottumwa last spring. Um, I believe they've been installing those meters across the district um, for those people who are served by Alliant. Um, and my understanding in leaving that meeting was that Alliant was going to do everything they could to accommodate those constituents who um, were not particularly pleased at having smart meters installed, that they would consider um, at that point in time anyway, perhaps leaving the old uh, analog meters in place, and that um, the conversation was still open. And um, other than what I've read recently, that is where I believed Alliant still was, open to the discussion and the conversation. Thank you. Marina? Uh, well, certainly there could be some uh, benefit to Alliant Energy and to their customers in being able to better manage load, uh, demand, uh, being able to um, uh, to allocate resources, depending on load and demand. If you're a high industrial area, your demand is greater for energy resources. But there are, um, as has been pointed out, uh, some pitfalls 
and some uncertainty that exists. I certainly think having an opt-out uh, would be uh, appropriate. Also have to consider for those people that um, are uh, trying to be off the grid or have solar or wind and have their own energy creation, uh, does this in any way impede them from being able to sell back energy to Alliant? So I think there are a lot of questions that we don't have the answers to, and I would su certainly support an continuing uh, and opt out as we uh, further discuss the issue with Alliant. Thank you. Move to question five. Mary, we'll start with you. Nine states now have legalized marijuana. Would you back a bill that would allow recreational use of marijuana or an expansion of medical marijuana use, which is allowed in 30 states? I would be open to that discussion. I don't know that at this point in time I would be prepared to back a bill to legalize, um, not for any specific reasons, but simply for um, because of a lack of information on my part. I've been asked that by people as I've traveled around the district, and I, I know that there is a great deal of interest in that. And I also have spoken to a lot of individuals who have an interest in uh, expanding um, the use of uh, medical marijuana also. So I'm not closing the door on that. I'm saying I'm open to the conversation. I just would need to create my own, um, you know, better aware and, and more information about the issue before I would be prepared to make a decision. And I'd also like to fully understand and research the, um, the social and the economic uh, consequences of doing that. Thank you. Marinette? Well, we know that uh, like many uh, plant-based medicines, uh, that there are, are some medicinal benefits to marijuana. Uh, and our state now has medical marijuana, which uh, is just uh, on the pattern of unveiling itself. Um, and I think there are other things that need to be in place. Um, I've been asked this question before, and I will go back to uh, looking at the DEA, changing the classification of marijuana. Currently, we can't do research on marijuana. We know that it has effects upon the young brain um, and uh, memory retention and memory loss. So we can't do research on marijuana. That's something that needs to change and should change, uh, even though there are states that have already legalized recreational use of marijuana. We also need to be able to uh, identify impaired drivers. We, uh, I, people will, uh, will quip and uh, make the funny comment that, well, if you're smoking marijuana, you're not out driving, you're in your house eating. But the fact of the matter is people are out driving, they are impaired. We can uh, detect impaired drivers from alcohol, but we don't have a way yet to detect impaired drivers from marijuana. So I do think there are some things that need to go into place. I would be in favor of expanding um, our current um, uh, medicinal uh, marijuana laws and would be in favor of looking at uh, legalizing recreational marijuana. But other steps have to be put in place first, and we need to know uh, the impact upon young people, addiction, have addiction services available, as we know that a variety of drugs lead to addiction. Thank you. Jeff, I'll read the question. Nine states now have legalized marijuana. Would you back a bill that would allow recreational use of marijuana? or an expansion of medical marijuana use, which is allowed in 30 states? Medical cannabis, medical marijuana, that has been an issue I have been involved in. I have testified in support uh, and subcommittee at the Capitol, and uh, I have close relationships with many patients around the state uh, who have ascribed benefit. And something that really has stood out in my mind is when a patient, he threw his prescription pills, morphine, Oxycontin, on the table and said these weren't working for him. And one statistic that really stands out in my mind that I came across is now we're facing an opium, opioid epidemic. And in places where there is access to uh, cannabis, that the rate of opioid abuse is less. I think it's really important, and something that's very personal to me, because I've, I've fallen into this trap, and I think it goes back to what I was saying about what's happening to our young men, is that there's a culture out there that would rather just smoke pot than go out and engage in the world. And so we're kind of cutting ourselves short and we're using you know, these substances to numb ourselves. And that's really, really sad. And it's something I've been victim to and still pray for forgiveness for. Um, but it's important though, the solution to addiction is giving people meaningful lives. The psychological research on this is 
very, very clear. If you have a purpose to wake up in the morning, if you have responsibility to shoulder and people are counting on you, you're much, much less likely to fall into addictive patterns. Um, so I'm very supportive of the idea because the prohibition doesn't work. Um, as many parents know, cannabis and marijuana is already readily available, even though it is already outlawed. Um, so, you know, I think we need to take a fresh approach and see what we could be doing better. Nine states have legalized marijuana. Would you back a bill that would allow recreational use of marijuana or an expansion of medical marijuana use, which is allowed in 30 states? Well, right now, uh, recreational use of marijuana is uh, legal in some states. It is not in Iowa. In fact, in Iowa, we have a cannabinoid oil uh, law that says that you can use cannabinoid oil, which comes from marijuana, uh, but the problem is here in Iowa, you can't ship marijuana across state lines. So where, where does this come from to make the product? So it has to be made here in Iowa. And there is a company in Iowa that is producing that now. Uh, to move on to the next step, should we allow medical marijuana use? Uh, I'm, I'm open to, to some thought on that. I'm not there. But I think if there are situations where uh, people have chronic illnesses and it could do some good, but then again, where does the marijuana come from? Who regulates it? The, the Food and Drug Administration? How do you know uh, what is there is there? Uh, is it grown here in Iowa? There's just an awful lot of questions. And then as far as recreational uh, use, I am against that right now. All right, we, now we'll go to question six with Marionette. He'll lead us out. As a general trend, Iowa farmers are aging, and a significant number of farmers are struggling with a succession plan. With agriculture being one of Iowa's top GDP con contributors, what do you see needs to happen on the state level to lower the barriers to entry for beginning farmers, i.e. access to capital, land, health care, credit, and business planning support? Well, this is a, a tremendously difficult issue, especially as the price of land has gone up, um, but recently the price of land has gone down. So, and farms being much larger now than they were before in the past. And for instance, a combine is upwards of $500,000. So for uh, a person to come into farming uh, without having a familial background or a heritage that uh, can help them access land, uh, it's extraordinarily burdensome. Uh, uh, sharecropping or rent, uh, renting farmland, uh, rent to purchase farmland, uh, credit the Farm Service Bureau working with uh, new farmers, mentoring programs through the Department of Agriculture, also through Iowa State University. All of these are avenues um, to helping to protect and engage uh, younger farmers. A lot of it is familial, but there are a lot of families who have century farms who no one wants to go into farming in that family. So bringing on a young farmer, having them farm, um, and perhaps uh, trade labor uh, for rent, and then also uh, purchase price of a farm, uh, renting equipment, owning equipment, sharing equipment, all of those things are ways that we can do to help um, engage uh, young farmers and also to let them know that it's a huge part of our economy in the state of Iowa. It's a great uh, occupation to go into, very rewarding. There's probably nothing better than to watch things grow. I love driving in Iowa and watching corn and soybeans grow. Love harvest time and you reap what you sow. Thank you. Mary? Um, I believe that if you can provide incentives to large corporations, you should be able to provide incentives to small businesses and rural agricultural enterprises. I know that there are at least a couple of programs that offer some sort of um, early support or incentive for young farmers who want to enter um, enter their, the farm operation or take over the family business but perhaps there could also be done, something done with deferred taxes at an early um, entry point for those people. I think we need to do everything we can to keep small family farms in Iowa. Um, there are a lot of farmers that I've spoken to over the last year who say their kids want a farm, they just simply can't afford to do it. So whatever the discussion needs to be, there needs to be a discussion to make sure that those people who want to continue farming as their way of life 
have the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Bill, we'll give you this question. As a general trend, Iowa farmers are aging, and a significant number of farmers are struggling with succession planning. With agriculture being one of Iowa's top GDP contributors, what do you see needs to happen on the state level to lower the barriers to entry for beginning farmers, i.e. access to capital, land, health care, credit, and business planning support? Right now, 82% uh, of the, the farmland in Iowa is debt-free. Uh, people 65 years of age and over own most of the farm ground. Uh, farming now is a, a very high capital uh, uh, industrial endeavor. Uh, it takes hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to, to farm now. This isn't like it was a generation ago with a section of ground with two or three family farms on it. Now it's a, a farm with maybe 10 sections or 20 sections. So how do you get into it? Uh, a relative, you work for a large farmer, you gradually get into it that way just like you would another uh, uh, business that takes a lot of capital. Uh, we've been in a low interest rate environment. I think that's starting to change. We've been in a high commodity price environment. That is changing. So uh, the uh, economics of farming, if, if, if things are starting to change, you may start to see more land being sold. Uh, I know for the last uh, several years, it's a rarity to see a farm sale, but I, I've been noticing that starting to happen again. So I think there will be some movement there, and I think there will be a, a, a new generation that will get a foothold in farming. Thank you. Jeff? Yeah, very interesting question, a very important one, especially as we look at revitalizing our rural communities, especially in the district. Uh, it's a question we have to ask, and I don't necessarily have any easy answers. It's certainly something I'd be completely open-minded and working with all the vested interests in and uh, the Farm Bureau folks and, of course, everyone who cares. Um, yeah, agriculture is, is tough, and I guess my priority would be, would be flexibility, and sometimes that could be getting government out of the way because the future is very uncertain. You know, we don't know what interest rates are going to hold. We don't know about commodity prices. We're waging a trade war right now that could make everything difficult and topsy-turvy. So no matter what the future holds, we need to have flexibility in making sure that we can adapt and evolve to meet the challenges of the 21st century. And that's where being open-minded, being flexible is extremely important. And anything we can do to add value to farmland, I've seen a lot of very interesting ideas as, as consumer preferences are, are shifting um, and as industrial ag continues to consolidate, I think there will be opportunities for experimentation. Uh, there's a farmer named Joel Salatin who I really admire his models of farming. There was a really interesting presentation last night, a lot of interesting, I think that is one of the cool things that Fairfield offers is a lot of interesting ideas when it comes to agriculture. Um, I have a friend who runs a compost company and he's not the only one. Um, so yeah, the more we can cultivate God's green earth for the beautiful of all, I think it's going to take flexibility and open mind and, and just no matter what happens in the future, just give us this day our daily bread. Thank you. Okay, we'll take question seven and we'll start with you, Phil. If you were elected or re-elected, and given the fact that the majority party in power controls the legislative process for allowing proposed laws to come to the floor of the Iowa House or Senate for a vote, what would be your top priority for the next legislative session that begins in January? Well, currently uh, our state government is controlled by one party. They control the House, the Senate, and the governor's office. Uh, they control every committee and every subcommittee. So right now uh, they can do pretty much what they want to. The debate is amongst themselves. Uh, I think that if, uh, if that were to change and I were to be in the majority party, uh, I would say uh, right off the bat, I would like to talk about uh, education funding, the supplemental state aid for next year, and get that set so that our school districts have, uh, have something to go on and plan their budgets that are due in March. And I will say this too, I would like uh, the, the process to be very open and that we uh, share the discussion with both parties and that we're bipartisan and that we, we don't do things behind closed doors. And we, we, we take time and we discuss things and we make sure that everybody understands uh, uh, what we're trying to do and come together as a consensus. But I would put the first priority as uh, setting our, our supplemental state aid 
for education for next year within the first two weeks of January. Thank you. Jeff, can you repeat the question? I didn't hear it. If you were elected or reelected, and given the fact that the majority party in power controls the legislative process for allowing proposed laws to come to the floor of the Iowa House or Senate for a vote, what would be your top priority for the next legislative session that begins in January? So, so I, just so everyone knows, I have kind of sold myself out to the anti-smart meter people. Um, I did tell them that if elected, that is my first priority, and we're going to be issuing you know, five or ten bills on how to make sure that people not only have a bona fide opt-out um, on the smart meter issue, but um, other things we can do to address that as well. Uh, so I have made that a very open and public promise that smart meters is my number one priority. Uh, number two, I'm very interested in criminal justice. Um, I, one thing I'm really proud of on the campaign is I've been able to work with our county attorney, Tim Dilley, and I've identified uh, very specific things we could do to improve our criminal justice system on how it relates to redeeming individuals, rather this um, kind of cycle of recidivism where people don't go to jail for being rehabilitated, but they go to jail to become better criminals. Um, I think there's a lot of leadership I could provide on that. And then, of course, uh, we need to drive health care costs down. I think that is probably going to be the number one thing that the next legislature focuses on is driving health care costs down. Um, that being said, even if I'm in the minority party, I think there is a lot that a member of the minority party can do, not just in introducing bills, but really invoking uh, the rules of the chamber, uh, procedural things you can do, offering amendments to even if you're in the minority party, you can really do a good deal to steer the conversation and make sure the voices of your constituents are heard. Um, but those are a couple of my priorities, and of course, uh, you know, there's a lot of really important things. I imagine myself introducing 100, maybe 200 bills uh, within the first few weeks of session. Marinette, if you were elected or reelected, and given the fact that the majority party in power controls the legislative process for allowing proposed laws to come to the floor of the Iowa House or Senate for a vote, what would be your top priority for the next legislative session that begins in January? So I have two priorities, and since I'm working full-time and campaigning full-time, I think I've got the energy to work on more than one thing at a time. Um, and, and there are two. One is we're, uh, Southeast Iowa uh, is an area that has a high, uh, high uh, rate of poverty and also low wages. So certainly what we can do with tax policy, regulation, and working with our federal colleagues on trying to uh, continue job creation here, a robust economy with higher wages, I think would be uh, one of the top priorities in our area. And we've already talked a little bit about the educational system not being able to fix all the social needs. But I think if we have better job creation, higher wages, more tax revenue, and then working with families, giving people a purpose, as uh, Jeff Shipley said, I think we can uh, do great things for our area. Second is health care, not just the Medicaid issue. The Medicaid issue is certainly a big issue that we have to tackle in the next legislative session, uh, but mental health, and then also health care in general. We need more choice. Uh, of all places in our district, uh, Fairfield is an area where there's a lot of choice. I remember as the director of public health, we had people within the department who wanted to do things on Ayurvedic medicine and put some regulations from people bringing things from India. And luckily, I was from the area, I knew something about it, and was able to, to have a conversation, a dialogue that uh, opened people's minds within the Department of Public Health. So more choice, lower cost. Uh, you know, it's not just a Medicaid issue. Cost of health care is too high. And so lower cost uh, and uh, better quality care. Mary? I want more than one. <laughs> but um, as a 33-year educator, education certainly is extremely important to me. But I have been campaigning since June of 2017, and I've knocked on thousands of doors in that time. And there is rarely a door that I knock on where health care is not one of the major topics of our conversation. Um, today there was an article in the Des Moines Register speaking about health care and the possibility of small hospitals, particularly rural hospitals, faced with the prospect of closure if something doesn't happen with the Medicaid system in Iowa. Um, I'm supported by the Iowa Hospital Association. I visited with them recently. They have a, a proposed plan, not a Certainly not the only solution, but at least an opportunity to have a discussion about the issue. 
And I would just say that from the number of people I visited with, healthcare is something that has to be fixed soon. And uh, Medicaid needs to be addressed and how we're going to fund that in Iowa is a, a high priority. Thank you. Move to question eight and we'll start with you, Jeff. The average hourly wage has not kept up with the cost of living as demonstrated by ongoing large increases in health insurance premiums or reduction of benefits and the cost of housing. What are the most effective ways you think the state can have an impact in helping working class families achieve the American dream? Yeah, the American dream, it exists, it's out there. Um, just to kind of give people a perspective of what our manufacturers are facing in town is that they're desperate for workers and they're having a real hard time finding people who can show up on time, finding people who can pass a drug test. Uh, the competition for labor is driving wages up. Um, so I think an entry level position at either Bovard Studios or Agro-Industrial Plastics here in town, it's $11, $12 an hour starting. Uh, with opportunities for advancement, with, with full uh, 401k matching, with full health benefits. And then again, the idea that if you just show up, do your job, and do it well, uh, there's opportunity to advance. Uh, there's a great companies that are providing very valuable products and services, not just locally, but also uh, across the nation, some internationally. Um, and then, yeah, it's really just supporting the entrepreneurial spirit. And that was a beautiful thing, watching the solar company grow, is when I joined uh, the team, you know, there's five of us in the back of uh, the back of the frame shop there on the square, and with a lot of sweat equity. You know, I didn't get paid for months, but uh, we put the work in. We said our prayers, and before we know it, three years later, we're employing 50 people, and we're we're bringing people in. You know, we had a, our most recent person came from Pennsylvania. And um, so the jobs are there, we're developing it, we need to really foster that entrepreneurial spirit. We need people to ask themselves, uh, what can I do to improve the community? What services can I offer? How can I use my God-given gifts to benefit the world? Phil? I'm uh, comfortable with raising the minimum wage. It's $7.25, it's been there for a long time. That's an annual salary of just a little bit over $15,000 per year. Uh, I, I think that needs to be brought up. And uh, I think it would be okay even to have a, a little bit of local control on that too, depending on the economies of different places. Um, I uh, uh, think that, uh, you know, uh, the amount of uh, what, what you get paid uh, is a reflection on what you put into your job. And I think there's been some damage done uh, within the last two years, uh, especially at the state level with the legislation that reversed the collective bargaining laws on our public employees and teachers. And I, I think that was a huge step backwards. Those programs had been around for 40 years and they were bipartisan in origin and, and now they're gone. And it's uh, uh, given some insecurity to our uh, teachers and our public employees who work hard and, and they, they've always counted on uh, some, some good uh, benefits and so forth. So I think uh, better benefits, collective bargaining, workers' compensation, and then raising the minimum wage, I'm, I'm okay with that. Thank you. Mary? Well, I believe there does need to be an increase in the minimum wage. Um, it's been a long time since minimum wage has, has was set. I believe it's 2008. I'm not exactly sure about the date of that. But um, the cost of living certainly has increased during that time. And as Phil mentioned, trying to live on $7.25 an hour is nearly impossible, if not impossible. And I see a lot of people who are piecing together two and three jobs at minimum wage, because minimum wage jobs typically aren't 40 hour a week jobs either. They're not full time and they don't come with benefits. So I think that needs to be done. You also, I believe you see it now that just shortages in the labor force are beginning to drive some wages up. Um, but. There's certainly more that needs to be done. And if it can't be done at the state level, then I'm in favor of local control. You may know that Wapalo County several years ago approved an increase in minimum wage only to have that reversed by the state legislature. But then the legislature itself took no action to increase wages for Iowans. And I am certainly in favor of doing that. 
Thank you. Marionette. Well, my first job was picking cucumbers at 30 cents a bushel. Uh, that was at age 13, and I rapidly learned that that was not the job I wanted, but I did learn skills uh, along the way uh, in interacting with other people, getting up on time, and being able to make my bus to go out to the field. My next job was 60 cents an hour working at Dairy Queen while I was uh, in community college. A minimum wage job uh, is not meant to support a family. It is meant to gain skills that you need to order in order to gain more skills, more education, and propel yourself in the workforce. And if you've signed a paycheck and you have a business, you know that the wage isn't the only thing in that business. So that employee costs a certain amount of money to every employer. So it's not just their wage, it's the property taxes on that business, it's the social security tax that you have to pay, health care if you pay health care, um, and then uh, the, how do you uh, purchase and put products and deliver a product. And a business knows how much it costs them per employee, and it's more than the minimum wage. So for instance, how many hamburgers do you have to sell in an hour in order to pay an employee X number of dollars and still attract people in? So the, the wage itself is a very complicated issue. I certainly think trade policy is important, immigration is important, regulation and how that impacts a business. Uh, don't forget, it, we want entrepreneurs because that's where um, the majority of new jobs come from, is from new businesses. But an, uh, an entrepreneur, a, a self-employed person, uh, small business, they pay the full freight of the Social Security and Medicare tax, so it's an increased tax burden that they have. And we know from economics that raising the minimum wage, if you raise it too high, you actually cost jobs. So well, you end up the next with question. less Thanks. jobs. Question nine, we will go with Mary. We have tried turning over state funds for mental health services to private gatekeepers, which have been met with mixed reviews. What do you think needs to happen in this area of services to Iowans? Well, mental health care certainly needs to be a priority in Iowa. I speak to people, again, all the time who have family members um, who struggle with this issue. Um, there is no care for these people in the state. I have spoke to a father of a young man just the other day who told me that his son had threatened to take his own life, and when he had nowhere else to take him, took him to the local emergency room where they sat for three days. And at the end of three days, without any uh, placement in sight, the, um, the, the hospital where they were offered a room, just a room, no furniture, nothing else. And when that father couldn't leave his son there in that kind of facility, he took him home and told me that he now sleeps every night next to his son with his arm around him so that his son doesn't get up during the, the night and harm himself. Mental health is a critical issue in Iowa, and now it's become a public safety issue as well. So whatever we need to do to address that along with the other medical care needs in this state, it needs to become a priority and very soon because there are lots and lots of people who are suffering and families that are suffering as a result of lack of uh, mental health care altogether. Marionette, we'll go to you. Well, we're, we're fortunate in our district that uh, we uh, just had the opening of the Southeast Iowa uh, uh, Mental Health Center, uh, which has certainly provided access to uh, individuals and has been a godsend to some of those people uh, speaking with uh, recently with a young lady who was there for several days when she felt she was in a mental health crisis. Um, but there's more that needs to be done, uh, working with our uh, local providers and local physicians, uh, be that uh, through the internet or using technology to be able to have um, joint services that are provided to individuals. As we know, it's very difficult to get providers to rural areas, so it's not only if the services um, are there, but can you get providers to offer services even if more money goes into that area. So getting providers to this area, using technology to be able to get providers, even if it's in a regular doctor's office or nurse practitioners of, or physician's assistant, um, working together in a collaborative environment uh, on mental health issues uh, with providers of different areas, using the internet uh, for that, making more beds available, using technology to be able to find beds so people aren't in emergency rooms waiting, calling every hospital in the state to find a bed for someone in crisis. Um, we certainly know that our law enforcement um, uh, individuals uh, 
are, and jails are not the places where people that have mental health issues should be uh, residing uh, because they don't have access to other um, mental health. Uh, so I think those are a variety of things we can do to address the mental health problems within our state. Thank you. Phil? We have tried turning over state funds for mental health services to private gatekeepers, which have been met with mixed reviews. What do you think needs to happen in this area of services to Iowans? Uh, the state established uh, uh, mental health regions, uh, which combines counties together to provide uh, mental health care. That, that's something that's uh, been happening within the last few years, and it is a good thought but the problem is uh, the funding. Uh, counties are, are grouped together, and maybe they might be more efficient, but uh, with more mental health uh, needs, uh, there's not an increased amount of funds there other than uh, raising property taxes to cover that. Uh, right now, you know, our acute uh, care centers are emergency rooms and jails. Uh, that's not right. Uh, we don't have that many residential uh, uh, treatment areas or, or places to take care of folks. I, I did see that the appropriations uh, from the Department of Management, the Department of Education for next year, the 220 uh, a fiscal uh, budget that starts next July, they're requesting, uh, I think, close to $450,000 for the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics to establish a, uh, a rural psychiatry residency. I think that's something that I hope our next governor, who, whoever that is, looks at and says, let's keep that in the budget. Uh, we need more school uh, social workers. Uh, we, we need uh, just an array of, of things to, to help uh, take care question. of the folks that are out there that need help. Jeff? So yeah, there is a, a mental health crisis in the state. It dates back to when the bureaucrats came in with unfunded mandates and kind of mucked around with the existing system. I'm thankful for Governor Reynolds and her leadership in a bipartisan solution. And certainly as a legislator, this is something we do need to fund and fund adequately and really address not just the political angle of it, but the social angle of it. Because these are very serious issues and, and life is tough. It's not every single person in this room, I guarantee, has very serious challenges that they're going through, whether it's a loved one or an illness or just the everyday difficulties of life. And that's where this, again, the psychological clinical psychologists are very clear. It's, it's connectedness, it's togetherness, it's community, it's having strong families. That's gonna be the basis of strong, healthy minds. And so we can't neglect the underlying cultural issues, um, but politically speaking, yes, we need to fund this. Uh, we, and I'm in favor of restoring power to local communities uh, to the greatest extent possible. And it is a very big concern, uh, but we need to look at the issue deeply and very seriously and what is affecting our mental health to begin with and how we can really come together and ask the difficult questions and reach out to our neighbors and our loved ones and say, hey, how are you feeling today? You know, what can make life better? How can, I, how can I be a better brother, sister, father, friend, whatever it is? That's what it's gonna take, people coming together. Thank you. Okay, so our 10th question is actually a two-part question. So you will have 45 seconds to answer the first question and 45 seconds for the follow-up. We will start with Marionette. Some occupations are keeping pace with the cost of living, however many are not. In Iowa's efforts to attract, retain, and engage families, what type of wage do you think employees need to earn to afford daycare? The follow-up is, what obligation does the state have to address the shortage of quality, affordable child care spaces in Iowa? So what's the cost of an individual or what's the salary an individual would have to make to uh, afford daycare? And I would say it would depend upon uh, the daycare provider and what type of service. So when we were, had gone to the University of Michigan, there were daycares that 
taught German and uh, had uh, uh, a lot of uh, crafts and other things, so the services that were provided were much greater. Uh, so I, I would think that uh, the, if you look at the minimum wage at $7.25 an hour, then it would be upward of the minimum wage. Do I think that's enough money to pay for somebody to take care of children? The most valuable thing we do in a society is to raise good kids. So I do think it's important that there's adequate compensation for doing that. Um, and again, there's a skills level that goes into that. As far as what's the state's obligation for daycare, I think the state needs to try to help to work to create and foster um, a climate where the economy grows, where wages increase, uh, and that includes two daycare providers as well. Mary? I'm gonna ask that again. <laughs> yeah, okay. Some occupations are keeping pace with the cost of living, however many are not. In Iowa's efforts to attract, retain, and engage families, what type of wage do you think employees need to earn to afford daycare? Follow-up is, what obligation does the state have to address the shortage of quality, affordable child care spaces in Iowa? Well, I would agree that the cost of daycare dictates to some extent um, what wage uh, should be available. I mean, I just, you can't really divorce any of that from the other. And a lot of it is based on where you live. I know that when my kids were small, we were fortunate enough, um, after a bad experience at an in-home daycare, to have a woman that agreed to come to our home every day. We were never able to compensate her at a level that um, she deserved, because daycare is high, and especially when you have more than one child. So I don't know that there's a blanket answer to that. So much of it depends upon the availability of daycare, the area Area that you live in, um, you know, the average wage of your area. Um, it's a pretty complex issue for, on a variety of levels. Thank you. Jeff? So uh, I'm not here, I'm not up here to give the easy answers. You know, I'm up here to ask the tough questions. And there used to be a time in this country where one wage earner was able to make a living and another parent would be at home to raise the kids and there wouldn't be so much reliance on daycare. Now I understand things have shifted and changed. Um, as far as wages are concerned, we want the most highest wages possible and if your occupation isn't giving you the wage you need, then we need an avenue to get the skills and the mindset to increase your wage. Um, but it's these larger cultural problems and it's very sad to see and my sales manager at work was the same way, where daycare for her child was a very uh, difficult position, and it was because her ex-husband was causing a lot more problems than necessary. And, you know, how can we fix the cultural issue okay, to make to the family strong again? Phil? For the last year, I've served on a local committee, and we're trying to uh, uh, come up with some uh, defining the need and some solutions for child care here locally in Fairfield. Uh, I think uh, our study showed that we needed uh, at least 400 uh, places for kids to go uh, from uh, that parents are, are looking for child care, 400 needs uh, that aren't being met right now. And uh, through that, we've encouraged uh, uh, local providers, uh, let's say a person that can take care of uh, up to five children in, in home to be, to be trained and to make sure that uh, when a parent leaves their child there, you make, you're sure everything's gonna turn out okay. But looking beyond that, we're coming up with a solution uh, that may be much larger than that, where we can use a local uh, uh, facility and maybe bring in uh, some some public uh, uh, okay, well, energy and private energy and get a, a big solution. But, but right. child care is important, and there is a solution. We'll go to question number 11, and Jeff, we'll start with you. Currently, the DNR has control of the issuing permits for the building of CAFOs. Are you in favor of restoring local control to counties to regulate the construction of these operations? So short answer, yes. Uh, my political philosophy is definitely grounded in local control, self-government. Uh, my constructive criticism to the JFAN crowd at their emergency meeting on September 5th is local control sounds great, but you need to consistently apply it. And it needs to be an overarching mindset of restoring power to the local communities. 
you can't advocate for local control on things you like and then totally ignore local control on things you don't. That's inconsistent and leading to failure. Um, and this is, I think, the biggest thing, is no matter what the decision is on any of these issues, the decision should always be made in the best interest of the community. The decision should never be made because a bureaucrat said so. And again, that was something that happened in education recently as well, where there's a very controversial decision. Doesn't matter what the issue was, but the decision was made because the bureaucrat said so. And that's one of the reasons I'm running for office, is we need to make sure that our local leaders are always making the decisions in the best interest of the community, everything considered, the local leaders have the power, and no matter what the decision is, it's always made because this is in the best interest of our community, not because the bureaucrat said so. Phil? Uh, swine production has certainly changed in Iowa over the decades. Uh, in the late 1990s, uh, pork got down to about five cents a pound. And that pretty much eliminated all the small private producers in the state. And it was after that that the corporate uh, companies came in and it became vert vertically integrated. So you've got the packer and the feed mill uh, and, and the pigs all owned by one entity. And then they, they started paying uh, landowners to put buildings up. To, to house the pigs, and then it was their responsibility to get rid of the manure. That's, that's what we're in right now. Now, the economics of this thing has changed drastically just in the last few months uh, because we rely on exports. And if we can't export all that pork and all the freezers in the country are full, uh, there may not be any place for some of this stuff to go. So the expansion of the uh, pork industry may be uh, coming to a, a halt here in Iowa because of of, uh, of the economics of it, but I do believe that the matrix that was set up in 2002 needs to be relooked at all the way through. Uh, that's uh, uh, almost two decades old and things have changed. I do believe there should be a way for some more local control and uh, uh, I think, again, uh, we can solve this problem. Uh, neighbors should be good neighbors, and I think most farmers and most farmers or the farmers that are hog producers, they want to be good neighbors, and, and, and I think there is a solution. We'll come together and we'll work on this. Thank you. Marionette. Well, I actually agree with both of the uh, previous statements, and so uh, like Jeff, generally I'm in favor of local control because I believe that the government works best when government's closest to the people um, that it serves. Uh, in the issue when we uh, come to the CAFOs, uh, you have two competing constitutional issues. One is uh, the right of private property and uh, to do on your private property. However, that's in contrast to another constitutional issue, which is the air, which they, you can't confine the air to your farm or your feeding operation. Uh, and I do think that with uh, trade, there will be some uh, decrease in the amount of pork production that will uh, be available as well, or the demand for pork production. So you have two competing uh, constitutional issues because it's not uh, localized only to this county or only to a specific town, you then are uh, dealing with issues that go across both state commerce and interstate commerce and even international commerce. That's why you then have uh, control or some authority that's uh, at the state level as well. Um, I have visited um, feeding operations uh, when I was director of public health and as a candidate who you would not be able to tell that there was a feeding operation uh, in that area, uh, but there are other places that are not as good, and that's where uh, your um, local control, uh, local authority, being a good uh, neighbor and a good citizen uh, comes into play. I do think working with the Farm Bureau, working with farmers, that this is an issue that can be addressed. Thank you. Mary? Well, I do believe that the master matrix needs to be revisited. It's been a long time since that was put in place, and I think that all parties need to be at the table. If you want to come up with a solution that meets everyone's needs and that solves the issue um, 
more on a long-term basis, then you need to have not only producers, but people who live um, in counties that adjoin CAFOs, whatever the thing may be. Um, I also think local control is important. I spoke about that a few minutes ago in regard to minimum wage. But when you're talking about issues like water quality and runoff and things like that, I don't know that local control, uh, it can be there, but there also needs to be some state regulation so that on a statewide basis, you have some consistency in how these standards are applied and safeguards in place to make, that, make sure that um, the environment, the land, the water is also protected. I think producers are as interested in um, the environment as we are as consumers or as neighbors of these operations. So it's a matter of working together to find solutions that work for everyone. We're all Iowans and we all want to preserve Iowa uh, as best we can. So there needs to be an opportunity to sit down at the table and discuss those issues and consider them carefully before we impose any additional regulation. Here we go, we're gonna start with Phil. What is your position on sex education, birth control, and abortion? I think right now uh, our public schools are handling the education part as well as parents. Uh, I know, uh, I think middle school science covers some of the, I think, as well as, uh, you know, mom and dad uh, talking about those things. As far as uh, birth control, I think that should be available uh, to uh, women. Uh, regardless of whether uh, uh, you're in the middle class, upper middle class, or whether you're in, uh, you, you are struggling with an income. And as far as uh, my uh, 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 opinion on, on, on abortion, uh, in, 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 I think it was in the early uh, uh, 70s, almost a half a century ago, uh, seven Supreme Court justices opposed to two Supreme Court justices, said that uh, a woman's uh, uh, privacy extends to their reproductive health. And uh, that's been the law of the land for, for a long time, and, and I support that. So I guess those are my answers. Thank you. Jeff. So I guess one of the most regrettable things in my childhood is that my parents didn't have that talk with me directly and they relied on the public schools to teach me and I wasn't taught that well. On the issue of abortion, I've been taught from a very young age from my parents, grandparents, my church, life begins at conception. I recognize not everyone agrees with that view and there's a lot of differing points of view. And one of the things I've always heard is that as a man, I shouldn't even have an, a say in that discussion. And you know what, that actually makes a lot of sense, that resonates. So that's why, you know, when it was the first female Speaker of the House and the first female Governor of Iowa uh, crafting, you know, the abortion restrictions and the abortion exemptions and when the t uh, procedure would be allowed, I was more comfortable with that. But this is the most important point, and this is what I'm going to focus on as a legislator and my sole focus as a legislator. I want to end the tragedy of fear. I want to end the tragedy of hopelessness. And so my message to any young woman who's dealing, or old woman, any woman who has unexpected, unplanned, unwanted pregnancy, my message is this. If you bring your child into the world, it's going to be met with love. Your family's going to be supported, and that child is going to have every single opportunity to live the best, most amazing life possible. I recognize that's not the world that exists today. But together, vote for me. That's the world we're going to create. Thank you. Mary? Um, in terms of sex education, I think that parents certainly have a responsibility to provide that to their children. But I also think that children can have the expectation that that information comes from somewhere if their parents neglect that responsibility. I think schools do a, a good job of providing very basic information on reproductive rights and reproductive systems and I think that's appropriate. Um, birth control, Senator Janet Peterson a year ago made a, a proposed a bill that would provide for over-the-counter birth control um, for women in Iowa. That never made it to a vote. I noticed the other day Governor Reynolds made the same proposal, so we'll see how that moves forward in the um, Iowa legislature. 
in terms of abortion or life, I believe that that is a decision made between a woman and her doctor. Um, you know, the Constitution right now, we have a law in place that grants that freedom to women, but I think that is a very personal, intimate decision that no one else should make for a woman. Marinette? Well, we are in the information age, so um, unfortunately, young people get a variety of information from a variety of sources. Some of it's very good information, and some of it is misinformation. Uh, certainly, I believe uh, your sex education begins in the home and with your parents, uh, but it's also bolstered and supported by our school system, by our public health system, uh, which also uh, has a lot to do, and sometimes it's within the school system. So I do think there are a variety of reliable sources uh, for children to uh, obtain information about their sexuality uh, and uh, um, reproduction. Uh, with that, however, is a responsibility that you have if you're going to engage in sexual intercourse. And I think uh, that a part of that responsibility is uh, birth control. And so for men uh, using condoms, I'm not going to exclude men out of this uh, discussion. Uh, so men uh, using condoms, um, uh, making sure that their partner is fully consenting uh, and is uh, either uh, addressing their own uh, reproductive needs. Uh, you have long-acting contraceptives, interuterine devices, the birth control pill, the morning after pill. I believe birth control should be sold over the counter, including the morning after pill, uh, so that there should never be an unwanted pregnancy. Um, Roe v. Wade, when it was passed, I lived in Texas, and at that time it was said this will only be a temporary measure until women have access to birth control. So we do have access to birth control, and we should empower ourselves to utilize it. I do think life is special. I think we should do everything we can to increase adoption and make it easier and less costly. Homeschool and charter schools have been talked about a lot in recent years. If tax dollars followed students into charter schools, revenue would be diverted from public schools. There is a real possibility that public schools would then be left with many of the most challenging students who require more resources to serve. In light of that possibility, how would you restore Iowa to its status as the number one state for public education of all students in the K through 12 system? And we will start with Mary. I believe you do that by adequately funding public schools. Um, public schools provide good quality education to the majority of our students. There are always exceptions to that and students have a lot of special needs. But I believe that Iowans' priorities should be in funding our public schools. And I say that as a product of a private Catholic parochial school for eight years of my um, elementary education as well. Then I attended public high school and I've attended public and private universities following that. But I believe that in Iowa, our first goal is to provide a strong public education to every student and to guarantee every student that opportunity. We had no money when I was a kid, but my mom made it a priority to send us to parochial school. And while there are hardships with that, there are also um, scholarships and other opportunities that are out there. But I believe public education should be our first priority. Thank you. Marionette. We have an excellent public education system. Thank you for unmuting me. Um, and uh, both my husband and I went to public school. Both of our children went to public school and graduated from Ottumwa High School. Um, I do think there's avenue for choice and for homeschooling. We currently have minimal support for homeschooling in our state, but we do have homeschooling support. And not every child is going to flourish or do well or meet their potential in the public education system. Uh, here in Fairfield, you have um, both the Maharishi and you have uh, the Fairfield school system. Um, I think if we can grow our economy and have more money, then maybe we can also look at uh, continuing uh, to uh, have a vibrant, uh, very active educational system within our district and within our state. Um, having said that, there are a lot of people who don't agree with a voucher system. Uh, they don't want to have more government control into their school system, but we have to have standards regardless of whether there is a charter or a private school, a private parochial school. You have to have standards of education so that children meet those standards and graduate with the ability to live, work, play, and raise a family in our state. 
Thank you. I'll read the question again. Homeschool and charter schools have been talked about a lot in recent years. If tax dollars follow students into charter schools, revenue would be diverted from public schools. There is a real possibility that public schools would then be left with many of the most challenging students who require more resources to serve. In light of that possibility, how would you restore Iowa to its status as the number one state for public education of all students in the K through 12 system? And we'll start with you, Jeff. This is a really important question. I think there's a problem. The problem is you can see in the way the question is phrased as it seems that the private and public educators are somehow in competition as if their interests aren't aligned. So the solution is making sure everyone's working together towards the same goals, because everyone wants a fantastic education. And if we can really get education right, there's no reason why a generation from now we can't be living on a much better planet. Um, as far as the actual funding is concerned, yeah, we need to ask ourselves, why, why are parents wanting to take their kids out of public schools? Again, I'm here for the tough questions. It's, it's what are the public schools doing that make parents want to take their kids out? And again, there was a, a decision was made uh, recently in the Fairfield School District where it was made because bureaucrats said so, and 37 really great families took their kids out of school. And, you know, that's multiply that over the years as millions of dollars out of the school system because we're making decisions because bureaucrats said so. So, again, the more local control. Uh, but even if there was a voucher system, you know, you could even, even do a fraction of the money. I was talking to a homeschooler the other day. So, hey, if it's six thousand dollars per a student, you know, slice us off 10 percent, you know, at fifty dollars an hour, that's 12 music classes. Just help us out with something. Uh, there is a disparity between the amount of funding that goes to public educators and the private educators, but I think the solution is going to be getting everyone on the same team, building the bridges between both private and public, and making sure we're all working towards the same goal, and get this idea of competition out of our head. Phil? Uh, right now, there are about 520,000 uh, kids in Iowa that attend kindergarten through 12th grade. 94% of those attend public schools. That's about 492,000. About 30 kids, 30,000 kids attend either parochial schools, private schools, or are homeschooled. And most of the homeschooled kids are, do that through a public school uh, service. But uh, I think the question here is about the money, and I think that's called vouchers and if if we would okay uh, that amount of money like the sixty five hundred dollars per student to go with the student to a private school or a public school or a, excuse me a private school or a home school uh, th that would absolutely be devastating to rural schools and I, I mean that it would really really hurt rural schools if uh, vouchers are funded uh, I, I right now the state does give over $50 million per year to private schools, public schools, and homeschoolers in, in forms of transportation funding, funding for books, and tuition credits. So uh, I, I think uh, that our public schools, if anything, are being underfunded, and we certainly don't want to take money away from them. Thank you. So now we're time for the closing remarks. So the candidates will have two minutes to prepare, and then we will start with our closing remarks. Two minutes starting now. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. We will start with Marinette Miller-Meeks. I'm Marinette Miller-Meeks running for State Senate in Senate District 41, which is, encompasses the four counties, uh, most of Jefferson, most of Wapolo, Van Buren, and Davis counties. I'd like to thank the Fairfield uh, Economic Development Association, the Chamber of Commerce, the Fairfield uh, Civic Center, and all of those uh, who are in attendance and who have uh, invested the time to be here tonight uh, when you may have other things to do, but it is a very important election. Uh, for me, the issues that propelled me to get into this race were health care, um, health care for all of us in looking at lowering costs, um, more choices, and better quality care, but also in the issue of Medicaid and where we're going to go and how are we going to both provide quality access 
um, with increased access as well as maintaining cost. A job creation and better wages. Um, I've seen this throughout the uh, time that I've lived here, uh, that we're not growing as rapidly as we'd like to grow, and we're a beautiful area of the state in which to live and work and raise a family. So what we can do to promote our area uh, and to bring more jobs and higher salaries, I think, is a critical issue. And then protecting the uh, tax uh, cuts and tax benefits that have come about in the past uh, several years that have helped the economy to grow, to wages to finally increase, and making sure that that um, also is reflected in our area. I've been a nurse, a doctor, a military veteran of 24 years. Um, I've worked as director of the Department of Public Health. I've volunteered uh, both in my church and in my community, and I have a vast array of knowledge and background. But it really boils down to a life of service. I've had a life of service. And the first thing you learn, both uh, as a physician, as a nurse, is to listen. And by listening and engaging and interacting and coming up with a plan, that meets consensus, you're trusted. I have the knowledge, the trust, the availability, the accessibility, the skill level, and both a variety of life experiences and educational experiences that really make me compatible with our district and with the job that we're going to have in the near future. Martin Luther King said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what can you do for others? I've had a life of service, I can continue in my successful medical practice, or I can forego part of that to be able to be of service to you in this district and at the state. Thank you so much for coming out tonight, and I would appreciate your vote and support now or on November 6th. Thank you. Mary Stewart. I want to thank everybody for participating in this evening's forum. Uh, the decision that you'll make on November 6th will help shape the future of Iowa. Um, we now have a majority party in power. I'm obviously a member of the uh, other party, and our differences and distinctions are many. Um, I've seen the privatization of Medicaid. I know that that probably was done with the best of intentions, but it isn't working for Iowans, or at least not for the majority of them. And something needs to be done with that quickly. Mental health services need to, to begin to take a priority in this state, because as I mentioned, now it's not simply mental health care. It also involves public safety. We need to fund education. Education is economic development for our communities. Everything from the students that we teach and train for the jobs of the future to the incomes that um, teacher salaries and, and school purchasing does in our, in our small rural communities. Um, we need to take care of tax breaks for large out-of-state corporations. That will bankrupt us as a state if it hasn't already, um, if it continues much longer. And I was especially disheartened to see the dismantling of collective bargaining and workers' compensation in Iowa. If you like what you saw over the past two years, then you know how to vote. But if you want someone who will end to fight the Medicaid privatization, invest in our schools and colleges, work for middle class tax reform and incentives for businesses that locate in southern Iowa, then I'm your candidate. Um, since June of 17, I mentioned I've driven nearly 25,000 miles around these four counties, and most of what I've done is listen to people, and I try to listen the hardest to the people who disagree with me the most. That's the biggest opportunity to learn and to create understanding between people. I believe that once you're elected, you represent all Iowans, no matter their party or their political point of view, and what you work hardest at every day is bringing everyone to the table to create a better Iowa for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Shipley. All right, well, I'm really fortunate to be on this stage and just thank you everyone for coming out and just for this opportunity to come together and learning and listening. You know, I got a big prediction for election day. You know, no matter what happens, life on November 7th will be very similar to what life was like before. You know, the, the politics matter, and these decisions do matter, but what matters most is the love we have in our hearts and the families that we share and the people we have in our lives and the connectedness we have to our community and what we can offer others. 
And so the more we can empower ourselves, you know, the more we can turn off the TV and realize that we live in a beautiful world, I think that's going to be the solution. That's what we need to do just as people to kind of snap out of these partisan games and this nastiness of politics that has just consumed us with this fear and just let it all go. So I'm here to, like I said, ask the tough questions and provide a voice to the conversation. And I think, I, I hope I've done that tonight. We've addressed on some very important controversial topics that, you know, politics, yeah, I can address, but it's not going to solve. It's going to take people. It's going to take a deeper level of love and commitment and devotion. It's going to take people working together. And that's what I hope to do is the more we can just articulate that positive vision, peace and prosperity, peace and prosperity, just invite that into our lives, in our lives, personally, in our communities. That's what it's going to take. And we need to grow. You know, we need, we need young families here in Iowa. And I think that's probably my biggest advantage. I don't know if you've noticed, I'm less than half the age of all the other candidates on stage. So when we look at the future... Just imagine the world five, 10 years ago. Things are changing quick. Try to imagine the years five to 10 in the future. Things are changing quick. You know, we need that fresh energy. We need that flexibility. We need someone who's prepared to understand and tackle these challenges of the 21st century. I think that's me. I think I'm able to demonstrate a greater degree of vulnerability, of honesty, of authenticity. And that's not putting anyone down. That's just, I really want to ask the tough questions. And I think we're being dangerously naive if we're relying on politicians to solve these problems. I can't do anything for you that you can't do for yourself. I want to empower you. I want you to live your happiest, most fulfilling life, however you see fit, guaranteeing the blessings of life, liberty, and love for every single Iowan, and breaking down and transcending these barriers that prevent us, prevent us from coming together, prevent us from being neighbors. You know, the ugliness and nastiness in politics, it doesn't have to be that way. We have a bright future. Our best days are ahead of us if we want them to be, if we can come together, if we can let go of the negativity. So I'm proud of the campaign I've run. I'm proud to be on stage, taking a real tough look at the issues, of restoring local control. I put out very in-depth issue statements on health care, education, uh, criminal justice, uh, you know, uh, putting really forth my viewpoints and offering specific solutions. So I'm just really thankful for this opportunity, thankful for each and every one of you. And, uh, you know, vote for me. I think, I'll, I think I'll do really good at this job. Phil Miller. It's been a privilege uh, serving as your state representative for the last year. Uh, it, it's a humbling experience. That, that word is used over and over, but it is humbling and, and it is a privilege. When I go to the State House and sit in the House chamber, it, it's just a beautiful uh, space. It's your space. And uh, there's the, the Greek columns, and, and uh, it, it's, it just makes you realize how important it is to be a state representative and the responsibility that I have. Uh, when I used to serve on the school board, I would write along the margins of the uh, agenda at meetings, uh, I, would, I would usually write three words, and they would be, be kind, be humble, and listen. And that type of thing I try to bring myself back to so that when it's time to make decisions, uh, I'll be strong and I'll, I'll make the right decision. Uh, traveling around the three counties that I represent and, and speaking to the 30,000 plus people that I represent, uh, one uh, common uh, topic comes up over and over and it, it, it is uh, the privatization of Medicaid and, and the problems that it has created. So uh, I think that needs to be reversed, and uh, I'm hoping that can be worked on in the next session. Uh, we've even got county hospitals now are starting to feel that, and it affects not only the patients, but the providers, but especially the patients. So uh, I think you've heard a lot from all of us tonight. You've got good choices, and by all means, uh, your, your uh, duty, your right, please vote. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank the candidates for coming to Fairfield and, and taking part in the forum. And obviously, I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight. I'd like to thank the Ledger, KMCD, and Fairfield Media Center for covering it tonight. And uh, thanks for stopping by the Fairfield Arts and Convention Center.